and welcome to exegesis number 162. Hmm. As I say in some of these things, the hmm. What is going on tonight that's different than other nights? Well, a couple of things. Uh, there's an introduction to a new book that we're involved in now that's going to be really great because it's a review of many of the other 10 or so books that have been covered over the past 162 weeks. And there's Leonard. Greetings and salutations. We start tonight this book, Intro to Heathenism. And I'm going to do it a certain way. Ah, I better uh, add all these goodies. I, I see them and then I remember. <laughs> we have a good evening and... Yes, this is, I think, the 10th book. Let me see if I count them right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And let me count them this way. I got another way. You got two ways to count this stuff. Um, where is the easiest number to count? Hang on. I got to count these books. Figures I picked the wrong one to look at to try and count. All right, here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is the eleventh book that we have been doing uh, over 162 Monday nights or 161 previous ones. And um, this one, as I started to say, is a certain kind of review. It, it hits on a lot of the stuff that was new when we first covered the stuff. And so we'll see how that goes in relation to your understanding. I think you'll like it. Secondly, we also continue, and I'm going to have to time this a certain way so that I can get um, enough done in our principles and practice of exegesis. Uh, manual. It's actually a classroom manual. And it's a, a very important help for understanding, you know, what is this thing that new people wonder? Uh, exegesis? Those of you who are not new know that when I pull up this board, I mean it. That if you're kind of new, expect not to understand some of this. I, I used to say as much of this as what? Well, as much as some others maybe. So hopefully um, you'll understand enough to make it worth your while. Is that a big deal? Well, let's put it this way. It's very probable. So it's not so much a big deal. I just have to point it out. Um, so heathenism, the book, Principles and Practice of Exegesis, the manual. And I will preview current events that need to be discussed that you may wonder some of the, the folks that I see here, like this guy who is not just a sheriff, as you will see shortly, and this organization, look at this. Now, on the back side of this, reminds me of my courier card in the military. With uh, It went from black to red to all caps. So this is not quite the same, but somebody must have had one. And <laughs> they got the same idea. But anyway, um, if you think, Oh, this is very funny too, by the way. Okay. On the back of Sheriff Daniel's card is a get out of jail free card. Good on February 29th of odd years only. And so what's funny about that is February 25th, uh, 9th never happens on an odd year. That's the beginning of, to give you an idea of the kind of sense of humor that this very fine gentleman here, and uh, there's a shot where you can see him. Um, I have, it's as thick, 
almost as this exegetical manual. <laughs> so if that tells you anything about information that you're going to get on Thursday night coming and two weeks from then, because it won't happen on that next thir Thursday night, but we have not only information from the sheriff, but information from Governors Abbott and Ducey. And I mean, I'm just beginning, okay? We're, I'm just throwing this out at you. There's the signatures on these letters. Uh, National Sheriff's Association. And you'll find out that uh, Sheriff Daniels has some very high credentials. By the way, this is a letter to, notice, look at the date, May 27th. And look at the addressee here. So if you think this stuff is uh, it's average paperwork, you're going to see some things coming up here. See, this one, look at this. To Honorable Joe, well, I won't say that. I'll just let you read it. May 11th. Okay, and uh, I want to see who signed it. Let me uh, get past that a little bit. We have a second page here. We're going to be covering this. These are all governors that signed all of that part. And more governors. And note the date. May 11th, page three of three. And that's just the beginning of what I have to show you over two Thursday nights. It's the only way I'm going to be able to do this. But I figured you might want to know what's going to happen to you and to everybody in this country and to a lot of people in the world based on what the leaders in this country are saying and writing, petitioning, threatening, you whatever you want to call it, it's a little bit on the hairy side, just a little bit. And so uh, if you think, and I mean, I've got, uh, let's see, if I throw this on just for fun, let me uh, give you a moment here. I've got some very good stuff here. I wish I could give you more tonight, but it's not the night to do this. Uh, but I will give you a little piece of, uh, so that you can hear. And I'll have this in, you know, uh, in a better format when, when we do this. Let me see here. Okay, so notice that. That was not a very good uh, clip. Uh, let me try this one. It's not loud either, and that's part of the problem, but it will be loud when you get to see it. All right, so uh, like I said, I have to put this into edited form in Final Cut Pro and compress the volume so that it gets louder and you can actually hear what the sheriff has to say. There'll be a little bit of that. Uh, we don't need to see too much except uh, some of it's fun. And I want you to be able to have fun and see, like I said, the guy's got a sense of humor here when he's got the sheriff card. And like I told you, he's a sheriff, but he's one of the top sheriffs in the country. And because of the associations that he heads, he gets to do things that other sheriffs um, don't actually have the opportunity to do. But I'm sure they think very much alike, um, many of them. But there are many who don't. 
And that's part of what we're going to find out also. So here's your preview of current events in regards to internal communiques between our state and federal heads. And this is not in the news. And it will be this Thursday, the 22nd of July, and two Thursdays from now, uh, or three actually, this Thursday, the next Thursday, no, the next one, August 5th, 05 August. Sorry, that's so small. But I want you to know that we're going to look at some things. Um, there's one other guy that I may um, also throw a, a few seconds. And again, this is not prepared the way it should be, um, but I, I think he's a lot louder and I want you to hear what he has to say. Let me see if this is going to be, oh, it looks like it's trying to download it. Here we go. All right, let me. Uh, it's too late, right? That's what's going on. This country's been penetrated at every level by the communists. This is not a joke. They're going to take us down. What is going on on that southern border with those Mexican drug cartels is being run by the CCP. Everybody knows that. That was a dirty little secret that was never a secret. The military knows it. Law enforcement knows it. The Chinese communists are running that operation. They're also running the operations in Chino Valley. Did you know that the Chinese communists are running the drug cartels that are running the marijuana groups in Chino Valley? Oh, really? Yeah. See, there's a lot you don't know about what's going on in your communities. And you need to be active right now. People are afraid to come to the meetings because of what happened in Washington, D.C. You know that whole operation was run by the FBI, right? Yeah. That's come out. We knew it. We couldn't say anything about it. But the journalists that wrote the stories, the FBI have been running operations like that for decades. It's nothing new. All right, so um, I'll uh, cut that right there. But I promise over the next two weeks, starting on Thursday, so this Thursday and two weeks from now Thursday, um, you'll hear some stuff that you probably have heard in some other way or form, but not quite as uh, clearly or lucidly and not quite as specifically as the stuff that you were going to hear um, and, you know, see written, uh, there's a certain amount that I can do. And after that, you know, obviously we know about shadow banning and whatever else, you know, there's a certain amount I can do. That's all I can tell you, but I'm trying to give you the heads up, uh, what this guy, Jim, who was just speaking said, uh, somewhere in, in his, uh, couple of clips that I have was he said, and, and so did the sheriff that if you didn't think that you needed to go to Costco and get supplies, and I have another uh, video that I think is from NTD that is more of an economic nature. And um, if you paid attention to the stock market today, don't pay attention to that. The stock market goes up and down and it will go down and it will get hairy and all that. And then it always comes back up. So uh, people that are panicking and, by selling their stocks and doing all these other things. Yeah, yeah, there's a little of this and a little of that, but don't don't be too concerned there. All right, I got to get back on focus here because I could get carried away on this number three over here uh, because there's a lot there. And that's why I said, uh-uh, we are going to do what we're supposed to be doing on Mondays and on Wednesdays. And on Thursday, for a couple of Thursdays, I can't do it next week, but on the See, what is that? The, the 29th, I cannot do it. So it has to be on the 5th. Is that right? Yeah, because we got 31 days in July. So 22nd, yeah, that makes sense. If we're doing it the 22nd. Uh, then the 29th is the one I cannot do. But be that as it may, we still get our stuff done, all of it, one way or another. Why? Jesus Christ controls history and God is in control. And those are two four word statements that uh, truer words were never spoken. So I come to this particular uh, board that looks like a scroll and uh, on purpose. And 
You know, we're not a religious broadcast around here. This is a theological, exegetical, biblical, spiritual, supernatural kind of information that we specialize in. And so when you look at this board and you see grace and the gospel are good news, that's what we do here. And religion is not good news, and that's why we don't do that here. <laughs> that's funny. It's true, though. And true or pure Christianity is not a religion, actually. And it comes from Judaism, and the true or pure version of Judaism is also exactly the same thing. It's what God designed and created as a means of communication for the purpose of having a relationship with us and to the other very important thing it does, resolve the angelic conflict, which we were going to hear more about as we go along. So if you think Christianity in its true or pure form and, and its parent Judaism are religions, then hear me out. All right, so we have one last thing, and I'm going to make this very short because I went, you know, I did a third subject, which I normally don't do, right? We don't have enough time for the two. So I'm going to do the abbreviated version of this. It says that if you do not have a relationship with the God of the universe, then you can do so by going to the foot of the cross. And what I mean by that is you can sit there in your chair or in bed or on the couch or wherever you are. Um, and just ask God to reveal himself. How? Well, the Bible says in Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So by, check it out, faith alone in Christ alone, you enter into a relationship with the God of the universe, the creator. There's only one. All the other stuff is fake. And so if you think all those other holy books are holy, I'll tell you, like everything else, it's holy with a, a lowercase h, not a capital H, because the only holy book is the Holy Bible. And the other stuff, uh, I won't say any more. I've already said enough. So at the moment of placing your faith in Christ, you get indwelt by the triunity, the trinity, the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, excuse me, the, the upper circle here represents union with Christ or Messiah. And that happens at the moment of salvation. Also, at the moment of salvation, you get filled with the Holy Spirit. That's different from being indwelt by God, the Holy Spirit, which you are. Um, but at the moment of salvation, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And through sin or sins, um, you lose that Filling, you get out of that bottom circle and you get controlled by the way you were before you were saved, the old sin nature that is in every cell of your body and that comes down as a result of the imputation of the first sin from Adam's original sin that God um, took away his triune, or I should say his trichotomous state and made him dichotomous. I won't elaborate, um, but point is, when you're controlled by the old sin nature, you need to claim 1 John 1, 9. That's what we're going to do right now. Take a moment for silent prayer. And 1 John 1, 9 says um, that if we name, claim, cite, admit, or acknowledge, the word in Greek is homologeo, and it means to name, claim, cite, admit, or acknowledge. It can also be translated from an older use of the word confess. You. I have to limit myself. I want to tell you that it's anachronistic and all that, but I'm not going to get into the details. Um, in other words, you can call it if you confess your sin to God, but why not say if you name your sin or, or cite it or claim it? Well, if you don't know, if you're a new believer, you don't even know about homardiology, so we'll skip that. But just put it this way. Oh, by the way, a new believer doesn't have to worry about it because at the moment of salvation, they are filled with the Holy Spirit, and you stay that way uh, until you sin. But then believe me, you're going to need to know 1 John 1, 9, because if you don't, you're going to miss the spiritual um, aspect, the, the spiritual information that cannot be understood any other way than by a spiritual means. And we're going to see, even in our book, Heathenism, 
I'll show you the picture because it's in here. There is a picture of, and I mentioned it before, and I, I saw it, and then I forgot it was in here, and I'd look for Operation Z, and uh, sadly, I didn't find it that time when I did that, but there's a picture of it here if I can get to it. Is that it right here? Should know the page by now. I have it memorized. Page 18 of our heathenism book is Operation Z. And you will eventually understand this better. Some of you already do. And there's even two different charts of it. Anyway, the reason I bring that up is um, when you get out of fellowship um, and you rebound, which is 1 John 1, 9, you name your sin, you get put back into fellowship with God. And you're able to therefore take in the supernatural spiritual stuff that requires that Operation Z is operational. Okay. So when you get out of fellowship through sin, you got to get rebound and get back into the filling of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to take a moment right now to prepare ourselves for the study of various things, God's word and all the other important theological premises that we're going to get from it. And uh, let me see if that'll stay put. I'd be curious to see if that'll stay put. All right. So let's take a moment now for silent prayer. Uh, if, again, you have never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as your uh, personal Savior, uh, the simple thing is faith alone and Christ alone. Just tell God you'd like to get to have a relationship with him and get to know if he really exists. And what's the deal? What does he expect us to do? Ah, there I knew that would happen. All right, watch this. I'm going to make it safe. I am going to keep the keep it up, and I'm going to put it in a way. Let's see if that works, okay? Because it's all distractions for me. All right, so without further ado, let us pray. We thank you once again, Heavenly Father, for your grace and for this opportunity to grow in grace. And we thank you for the fact that we can have a relationship with you and come to your throne in heaven uh, by means of prayer and that at uh, maybe faster than lightning speed. I don't know what's fast, but whatever it is, it takes a nanosecond that when we are in fellowship with you, anything that we say and anything that we get from you is in real time. And that is uh, mysterious, mystical, supernatural, spiritual, and all kinds of old words. We thank you for this privilege. We thank you now for the time we're going to spend together. Please help us to understand these things fully and to store it in our right lobe of the soul that we'll be able to apply these principles whenever they are required. And we thank you for all these things. And as always, we ask them, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in Christ's name, amen. So here we are again, Monday night, and we get to do what I call an overview of this whole book. You know, we could read a couple of pages, but I think the first thing we need to do is see the whole book from, you know, cover to cover. Uh, there's a total of 34 pages, and that includes, that's it, the, uh, what do you call it, the scripture index. All the uh, the verses that are quoted in this book are listed in case you can't remember what it was and you know it was Old Testament. You go here and you look and you say, oh yeah, it was Genesis 2-7 and that's on page eight. And so you're able to find passages and with the reference, you know, uh, whatever was being taught in that section. And that's a very helpful tool. These books are very academic. They're very well written and even edited and then, uh, you know, sometimes corrected in future editions and then released again. This original uh, book, the original version of it, came out in 1973. And I have a copy here that I got in 1980. Let's see if I can get that up there where you can see it. And when I got it, 
the one that I got, so the version that it was, said it was from 1979 and that it said first edition published 1973. Now, because I'm a book person, I like to bring out these things. Look at this. In the front, it says Basics Book 10. Now, I don't even know where this says. Yeah, see here it just says heathenism. And this is the, the current copy. And so, you know, little changes happen in these various editions. But uh, things that I'd like you to see. So, for example, uh, there's a little explanation here of the cover that says from Romans 1, 22 and 23. And this is pertinent. In Romans 1, verses 22 and 23, it says, professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. And that's a little bit um, kind of where this idea for this picture, the drawing, comes from. And it was Katie, Miss Katie Tapping who did all the artwork for these books back in the beginning. And so as we go to the next page, I want you to notice the financial policy. And I will show you something here, which is a catalog. And we'll look at that in a second. The financial policy here states that there's no charge for any material from RB Theme Junior Bible Ministries, anyone who desires Bible teaching can receive our books, MP3, CDs, and tapes without obligation. It's funny because they don't have tapes anymore. But um, the MP3, CDs, and DVDs, I guess they need to, to change this uh, in the financial policy as far as the future edition. God provides Bible doctrine. We wish to reflect his grace. RB Theme Junior Bible Ministries is a grace ministry and operates entirely on voluntary contributions. They don't ask for money, okay? There is no price list for books or tapes. In this case, uh, CDs, MP3s, DVDs, whatever. No money is requested. In fact, they maybe don't do uh, CDs anymore. I don't know. Uh, when gratitude for the word of God motivates a believer to give, he has the privilege of contributing to the dissemination of Bible doctrine. All right, so um, another thing that I should note is check this out so you can see why this financial policy is written this way and should be updated. Um, if you look near the, well, the middle of all this stuff, it says here, copyright 2001. And then it shows 79, 73, first edition published 1973, third edition published 2001, second impression 2004. So we're already 17 years in the making that they have not redone this book. And if I think about it, the next time I contact RB Theme Junior Bible Ministries, I'll mention that in this one and others, I'm sure, that are similar in age, they could update all that for future editions when they go to press. And I'm sure there are reasons that everything is the way it is. Now, when you get to the table of contents, which theoretically, even though there's no page number there, Let's see, three, two, one. Yeah, these are a couple of pages, like contents and preface. They don't have page numbers. Uh, that's another thing they could do is put in all the Roman numerals, you know, like uh, uh, Roman numeral with I for one, and two I's for two and three, and four is IV, meaning one minus, uh, five minus one is page four. Yeah, they maybe need to do some of that if they want to. It's a lot of extra work. But anyway, look at the preface. You see, that's going to be the first thing that we look at. And then the table of contents. What about the heathen? The angelic conflict. I showed you a little book about that earlier. 
the essence of God, the attributes of God, the unseen soul, independent volition. People say we don't have free will. Uh, the consequences of Adam's decision, the strategic victory on the cross, unlimited atonement because of it on the cross, God consciousness, mechanics of God consciousness. After God consciousness, what? Historical evangelism. So who are the heathen? The pattern of heathenism and the answer to heathenism. So all of that in this little booklet. And like I told you, a lot of it is review. So it's really kind of special and fun. Now, in the preface, let's see what that says. Before you begin your Bible study, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, be sure you've named your sins privately to God, uh, God the Father in this case. And there's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our known sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our known sins and to cleanse us from all unknown or forgotten sins, all unrighteousness. That's the unknown or forgotten sins. You will then be in fellowship with God, filled with the Holy Spirit, and ready to learn Bible doctrine from the word of God. Now, here's John 4, 24. Quote, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in the filling of the spirit and biblical truth. So, again, that's John 4, 24. If you've never personally believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, the issue is not naming your sins. The issue is faith alone in Christ alone. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not believe, I'm sorry, does not obey the command to believe in the Son, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's John 3.36. So, and John 3.16 is the one that says, for God so loved the world that he uh, gave his uniquely born son that none should perish, uh, and but you know believe in him and come to eternal life. Now, at the beginning of every Bible class, the colonel who wrote all this stuff used to always used to always read uh, these three verses at the beginning of every Bible class, and it goes like this. The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints of the marrow and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And as you can see, that's three different scriptures, three passages. And Bobby, the colonel's son, uh, major RB theme, the third, uh, pastor theme, uh, the second, <laughs> as in uh, not the colonel, um, Bobby would say that these verses were a good uh, warm up your, your lips, your tongue, your mouth, whatever, to be able to say all this. Because the way the colonel would say it is, the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints of the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and righteousness, that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved a workman or unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then he'd say, open the word of truth tonight too. And then it would be whatever we were working on in that evening in that uh, particular book or uh, epistle or whatever. And so anyway, that's how the colonel always started. And, oh, I see that... Uh, uh, like it says here from Twitter, Billy Tennessee has retweeted. So hopefully, hmm, yeah, we continue. <laughs> hopefully uh, some people will catch on and uh, either catch a replay on YouTube or Twitter uh, or, you know, play it, start it over again. Uh, if you missed the beginning, it's good to go uh, just 
when you get a chance, especially if you stay the rest of the night, uh, when we're finished, go back to the beginning and see what you missed. Now, we start in earnest. This would be page one. What about the heathen? And I'll just hold it up and read along, and you can take a look at what it says here. People of primitive cultures. Oh, and I've got to show you a couple more things. You know what? Before I even start, I want to pull this up. Uh, this is the habit where I actually will show you that there is a doctrinal Bible studies catalog from RB Theme Junior Bible Ministries. And all I have to do to get it and to get this book that we're doing and the basics books like the plan of God and the Trinity, and again, they're little booklets, is content, uh, contact them. Remember, there's no cost or charge. You can, if you have no money or wish you could get it and you know, wait till you get your next paycheck and all that, no, don't even wait. Call them. There's a phone number or go online to rbtheme, T H I E M E dot org, and uh, tell them, hey, I heard about this ministry through some guy on whatever. Uh, Twitter, Periscope, YouTube that is showing about these books and stuff. And he said to get the the book, the new one that we're on, uh, which is Heathenism. And But I'd like to get the first books and the catalog and get to know about this whole ministry. Well, there you have it. Um, if you contact them, they will send you that and a bunch of odds and ends, and you'll get to see like little uh, descriptions of you know, the various books, page after page of them. There's, I think, around 70 of them. There used to be about 100 of them. And uh, so every page just shows you more and more about these different books. And then later on, there are series of subjects of available on video and certain things that are available on, uh, let's see. Uh, what do we have here? This is a bunch of video stuff. Where is it? Uh, there's audio recordings and... Everything is listed in this catalog. And guess what? You can do all this and not have to, you know, go to the registrar's office and pay money and go in debt. Uh, in fact, you can ask for all this stuff. And uh, if you can't afford it, they'll just give it to you. And if you feel like giving to the ministry, you can do that too. All right. Now we continue in earnest at the beginning, which like I said, it doesn't say that it's page one, but on the following page, you'll see page two. Here we go. So as I was reading, uh, people of primitive cultures have lived for centuries in the remote mountains and jungles and deserts of the world. Wherever they are, these communities are far removed from the mainstream of commerce and civilization despite the advances in communication technology. They may be the Papuans of New Guinea, uh, the Hottentots of South Africa, or an Indian tribe in the Amazon. Invariably, the skeptic of Christianity will ask, what about the heathen who have never heard the gospel? How can these people decide for or against Jesus Christ? If the skeptic truly wants an answer, he should ask, what about those who apparently have never heard the gospel? Although he may be ignorant of the facts of worldwide evangelism, the underlying implication of, this, of his question is clear. God is unfair. How can a loving God condemn anyone under these circumstances? This accusation against God is the very reason why we are here in the first place. Okay, now page two deals with the angelic conflict. And as I mentioned, these are skinny little books, right? But guess what? There are thicker ones too. And this angelic conflict book, it's not one of the thickest, but it's in the medium category. It has about 178 pages. And see, this is a, a subject index. And let's see here. Does it call it that? Yeah, subject index. There's also, like in the other one, the scripture index. And, and then there's, a, I think we have a glossary 
and a couple of appendices, at least one or two. And um, let's see, is there more than one? Oh, looks like, oh, and there again is Operation Z on page 147. Yeah, there's only one appendix, and it's called Elect Angel Organization. And, you know, look, it's scholarly, and it's got all of these scriptures everywhere, and it's the introduction. And, you know, to a, a, a doctrine, let's call it. So the point is that a lot of these things are they're there but you know that question like there's no there there well here there is there is there there so there is there there you get th three there's in four words there is there there <laughs> and i've never had to deal with that before but look they show you for example a timeline of the angelic conflict that's what it says at the bottom. And it shows things like something called dispensations, different eras that we're in, and the prehistoric trial and Satan's appeal, coterminous with all human history and all these parts in between of what goes on. And down there in the, uh, breaks the age of what's called the prehistoric trial and then the Gentiles. Israel, hypostatic union, the church age, which we are in now, the tribulation, the next uh, event in, um, uh, what do they call, what do they like to say, prophetic history, and millennial, the millennial period, the millennium of a thousand years, which is what mill is, which is why when you see those signs, like, uh, let me grab this here, and show it to you. You know, when you see a movie and at the somewhere in the credits at the beginning or at the end, it'll have something like this. It'll say it'll have usually a, a, a C for copyright, and then it'll do this. Like if it has, um, oh, hold on a sec. I, I got to start with the right letter. All right, so you have your little copyright thing, and it'll go like this M. And you might see, uh, let's see, which one is it? C. Um, and then it might have like L, and then let's say V, I, I. Ever seen that kind of stuff? Okay, what this says is uh, 1957. Why? Because M stands for 1,000, C stands for 100, L stands for 50, V stands for 5, and I stands for one. So what you have is 1,000, 100 minus 1,000, which is 1,900, 50, five plus two is seven. So do you guys know how to read Roman numeral uh, dating? Because that's how they did it in the movies um, in Hollywood. And so I always notice that stuff, but they also do it in different other things. And whenever you see all that stuff, if you can't read, uh, here's a comment. If you can't read the, um, the Roman numerals, uh, and again, you know, I have all these books trying to see where some of them are because I'm always moving them around. Um, one of them is on Roman history. And I'm trying to think, where did I put that one? Is it back here? Hmm. Oh, okay. It got put. It's further back. It's in a back pile somewhere. Here's the White House. Well, I can't say that that's going on right now, but it's still the White House. Oh. All right, here's two books that I can pull up for you. One called The Ancient Greeks by Chester Starr. And guess what? I have another book called A History of the Ancient World 
also by Chester Starr. Notice the difference in thickness of the two. Uh, but this one was a gift. And since we're talking about heathenism, and look, here's what my friend says. I had two of these, so I'm giving you one. Enjoy, Kendall. Hope your dad's better. Keep us posted and tell Susan hi. So this tells you what era it was. It was a week before my dad died. And there's the date on it saying 04 December 91. Well, it was 11 days before my dad uh, passed. Get from Kendall. So, um, yeah, sadly, that was uh, when my dad passed away. But this book has a lot of interesting things about the ancient world and the Greeks, of course, and, you know, pictures of stuff that was going on. These uh, amphitheaters, which was always awesome. And, you know, some of their ancient pottery of sorts. Uh, some of these are very fancy schmancy. So you have, and they're in libraries, you know, and, and they're literally, they can be made with porcelain and, and precious metals and all that kind of stuff. And so a lot, of, when you think about it, these people in the ancient world had a lot of things going on and some really great things, but they also had some horrible things going on and a horrible mess going on. And in certain ways, you could say it's not unlike today. We have a lot of really great things going on, but we also have uh, some messes. And so as you will see in this book, um, we're going to start to see details of what this book has to offer. Let me see here. Well, let me take us back to where we are. Now, what I'm going to do, I mentioned the beginning here, this is why we're here in the first place. And as far as I mentioned the angelic conflict and showed you a thicker book that explains a lot of things prophetically, you know, what happened in the past, what happens in the present, and what's going to happen in the future. See, look, attacks on the genetic line of Jesus Christ. That was in the past, but it didn't work. And then you have that timeline that we saw. And then that went into both the, well, all three, the church that we're in now. But then there's going to be the rapture, as it says right here, rapture. And then above it, the second advent of Christ after the tribulation. And then at the very top, at the end of the millennium, the Gog and Magog revolution, which is when Satan gets released and uh, eventually, uh, you know, whatever the word is, uh, beaten in this huge uh, angelic conflict. Now, here we see the offensive strategy of Satan. You can also pronounce it offensive because <laughs> it's at least both. Um, now, here's one that you could understand for today. Apostate leadership in the local church. See, apostasy is the rejection of Bible doctrine and the acceptance of false doctrine, Hebrews 3.12. Now, as I told you, these are extremely, um, you know, edifying and academic books. Chapter 7 is the defense, uh, defensive action by believers. Okay, so it tells us what the believer's objective in life is. And then it shows you all about the armor of God, the things that we're supposed to be wearing and doing and having and how we do what we can do. And like it says, chapter eight, how can a loving God eternally condemn his creatures? See, people are going to argue about that. Wow, a loving God would never do that. So, um, and again, you'll find that whenever there are technical things like seraphim, description, definition and description. So take a look there. And it says seraphim, and it shows you in Hebrew, seraphim. That's how you spell it in Hebrew. So 
In some ways, here's the one for cherub. That's how you write cherub in Hebrew and cherubim in the plural. And so um, you actually, with these books, learn technical things. And it makes sense. We should know these technical things. They may be technical, but they're not so difficult that we can't learn them. And they can also be written in a more basic form for, let's call it, uh, new believers. Or there's what you'd call, there's baby believers, there's adolescent believers, you know, there's the adult believers. And some of the basics books are written with that in mind. They're a little, they're still academic, but kind of like elementary versus junior high versus high school versus college versus graduate school versus postgraduate level. You know, everything gets more and more intense and complicated as you get, get deeper into it. So again, at the beginning here on page two, we start with the angelic conflict. And there's much explanation and footnotes and so on. Gets into the essence of God, which when you get these basics books that I told you about, and you want to start with the first two, one is called The Plan of God, Basics Book One. And in the back, they will always show these um, basics books by R.B. Theme Jr. recommended sequence. And the second one is the Trinity. I call it the triunity every time I say that. Why? Because it also better represents the fact that it's a triune God. It's three in one. There, it's one God, but it's three gods. And you say, how can that make any sense? I say, well, it's one egg, but it's got the shell, the white, and the yolk. There's three parts to it. And they all go together and each is different, but they're still part of the egg. Well, the Godhead, a triune God is all like coexistent, co-eternal, co-equal. You know, there's, they're all um, the Father, Son, and Spirit. They're together. There's nothing that's not together about it or about them. So this gets into the essence of God in terms of his attributes which in the second book, the triunity, as I call it, the Trinity, uh, you find out about the essence box and the 10 characteristics of God. And so here he talks about, you know, God's uh, righteousness and justice. And then it goes on uh, his sovereignty, omniscience, he, he, that he's eternal life. He's omnipotent. Um, he is omnipresent. He's immutable. Uh, he is eternal life. He is love. Uh, he is truth. And so anyway, you get through the 10 things. And this book talks about some of all that. And then it goes into the unseen soul. So remember, we're going through a quick overview of the book. And that's why I'm moving along. We're on page eight now, where we see the essence of the soul. And the soul is really above the brain. It's, it's an outside us and inside us. But this would be a way to diagram it, showing the soul and how in our brain, we have our mentality, we have our self-consciousness, we have our volition, and we have our conscience. And all of this stuff, you know, really goes together. And then let's see, what else? It goes on into something called unlimited atonement, which is what happened when Christ died on the cross. He died. For all of the sins, this reconciliation includes the whole world, okay, of the, the barrier between God and man, which is sin. And here in heathenism is a good place to talk about God consciousness, because somewhere along the way, we become conscious of the fact that there is a God. And so there is a section on the mechanics of God consciousness. Dealing with the three basic means of perception, these systems, and they're simply called empiricism, rationalism, and faith. And I think those are covered in the plan of God in the very first book. Um, and then there are these arguments that we study in theology. 
And there are these four main arguments called the religious argument, uh, the moral or anthropological argument, the ontological argument, and the teleological argument. Those are four different ideas and ways of trying to understand uh, about God and about man and about the situation that makes us apart or separate until we are redeemed and then we're together. So then when that happens, it says after God consciousness, what? Okay, because God consciousness, you get to this Operation Z again, which is the mechanics of salvation. It also, there's another chart of the Operation Z. Instead of being the mechanics of salvation, it is written a little differently. It's still a Z, but it then shows instead of the gospel first and then the Holy Spirit acting as a, a human spirit, and then it goes down to the soul on that bottom left, and then over to the right where you get regeneration or creation of a human spirit, and that's at positive volition, you become a believer. Well, the other way to draw Operation Z is um, for spiritual growth, showing in the spiritual life how you end up growing spiritually. And instead of getting the gospel, it's a pastor who teaches uh, Bible doctrine, and that goes over, and you believe it. And when you believe it, it's ready to be used. And then, boom, you apply it at the other end there. So that's another way to describe another aspect. Instead of the mechanics of salvation, um, it's the um, mechanics of spiritual growth and application of doctrine. So there, um, or as Joe would say, there's that. So there's that. Um, and so that's that part. All of this is in our book, so it's going to be really great. Um, historical evangelism is another important section and talks about how um, ex, uh, the, uh, the setup of evangelism starting, it says the gospel is not something new. It is something extremely old. The gospel dates back to the Garden of Eden, making it the heritage of the entire human race, Genesis 3.15. So the next several pages uh, have wonderful explanations and uh, discussions of all of that. And then finally at page 25, it says, so who are the heathen? And <laughs> as far as heathenism goes. And so then you have all of that involved in pages 25, 6, 7, and 8. Here's the pattern of heathenism. And then... Uh, at page 28 and 29, at 29, the answer to heathenism, and there's Romans 1 14 that says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So remember, this is 2,000 years ago. This is the period from where I was pointing to these books back here that I showed you earlier by Chester Starr. And, um, you know, those people back then, all the way up to now, uh, the says, uh, it's more than our rightful obligation. It is our privilege to tell others of the Savior. So in this book, we're going to cover everything about the issue of unbelief, the state that we are in as we are born into this world, we're all born unbelievers. We're all born spiritually dead. We're all born heathens. And heathenism is the natural process and beginning of every member of the human race. Sad, but true. So, um, our book will explain that state and how we get out of it, which is through all of this stuff, salvation, and then Bible doctrine, which is what we've been doing 
So we start a new text and we keep going and keep going and keep going. And what's fun is every one of these books that we get into that the Colonel wrote and provided because God provided those books, that information for us, all of that is a mechanical way to get us to grow enough to be able to start at the beginning and just like we do with kindergarten where we learn numbers and we learn the alphabet, we start to learn to do mathematical computations. We start to learn vocabulary, grammar, putting everything together so that it starts to make sense. And the next thing you know, your life starts to turn into this big thing where all the things around you either make sense or even if they don't make sense, they are a part of the world and the universe, you know, directly around us and then outward. And these giant books called, you know, various versions of the Bible. And when I say versions, they're all the Bible, but one will be a new American standard. One will be a new English translation. One will be a life application study Bible. One will be uh, another uh, New King James Version study Bible that says what? It says something in there that I can't quite read. A complete study system. And so in every sense, when we get a book or we even get a study Bible, I'm going to show you that one. Figures, it has to be at the bottom of the pile. So, but I can lift the other versions. Uh-oh. I've got to put a couple of them back or all these other books are going to fall over. <laughs> there we go. All right, now I can show you this one. Well, I just see this one called the Nelson Study Bible. Kind of interesting because it shows the sky and kind of, and it's got some uh, embossed stuff there that says NKJV. Kind of hard to see in the clouds above it. And well, the reason I'm pulling this one up for today is I wanted you to see. Oh, uh, it did come in a box of some sort, and I kept a part of it so that you could say, "What does this one do?" Complete study system to bring you the finest study Bible ever. And so blah, 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 right? I don't even know if you can find this one anymore, which is dumb. But what happens is you have the Bible and you got zillions of notes. But what's really fun too is once in a while, you'll have um, little sections. Like for, there are word studies. You can see there's one here. Let me see how can I get that there. And so it'll talk about dancing. Uh-oh, Baptists won't like that one. Um, or maybe they will if it said there's no dancing and the Bible says you can't dance. And the Baptists will say, oh, that's right. Okay, here's another one. So this one wants to be on the word witchcraft. Ah, see, and we're in 2 Kings, and that's where you learn about the witch of Endor. Remember Star Wars? We have to go to the planet Endor. Where do you think they got that name, Endor? They got it from, and by the word, uh, by the way, the word for witchcraft, the Hebrew word is keshef. And it says, this Hebrew word usually appears along with other words that denote various forms of magic or divination. Second Chronicles 33, 6, Jeremiah 27, 9, uh, Micah 5, 12. The word used here seems to have the basic sense of witchcraft or sorcery. Sorcerers interpreted dreams, prophesied, and performed miracles. Exodus 7.11, Jeremiah 27.9, Daniel 2.2. 2. They had access to the royal courts of Egypt, Israel, and Babylon. And that would be in uh, 9.22 and Exodus 7.11 and Daniel 2.2. 2. Sorcery was forbidden in the law of Moses with capital punishment prescribed for a sorceress. Uh, Exodus 22, 18, Deuteronomy 18, 10, and 11. Many of the Old Testament prophets directly link divine judgment with sorcery, 
even expressly citing it as the cause, Isaiah 47, 9, Nahum 3, 4, and Malachi 3, 5. The Lord did not want his people, capital H, his people to look to such deceptive sorcerers for direction. Instead, he promised to rise up, I'm sorry, to raise up a prophet like Moses, which he did, his son, Jesus, um, Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 15, and Acts 3, 22 and 23. So what happens there, not only do you have, quote, a word focus, there's the one we just read, and you have all of the scriptures there, and then you have notes underneath, you can see all these footnotes on each page, and other uh, cross-references for each verse. So in verse 28, you can go, uh, we're in uh, 2 Kings 8. Well, if you're in 2 Kings 8, verse 28, it, you can go to, for, and it says for A in the notes in that verse, 2 Chronicles 22, 5, B, 1 Kings 23, or 22, 3, and 29, and so on and so forth, see? So um, it gives you a lot of study Bible, blah, blah. And then what's really also special, one, a third kind of thing in this book is uh, I'm trying to get to one of them, and there are many. For example, here's an Old Testament timeline. And it would give you, you know, what's happening at circa 2500 BC. So you'd have the Great Pyramid built at Giza. And in 1800 BC, the reign of Hammurabi, who wrote a very special code, and he was not a believer, and yet the Hammurabi code, like a governing thing. But look, see how it shows underneath that around 26, I'm sorry, 2167, uh, Abraham is born. And around another 167 years later, to around 2000, all the way to 1800, you have the events in the life of Job. And then uh, in circa 1527 BC, Moses is born, just a, right in the middle of the Hittite Empire, which was circa 1750 to 1200 BC. Well, guess what? People thought the Hittites don't really exist. They've never existed. We never have heard of them. We've never seen anything about them. And then what happened? Archaeology discovered stuff and they realized, oh, these are the Hittites. And then they said, okay, so you mean the Bible was right? So they said, oh, the Bible's wrong. These people have never existed. Well, they had just never discovered them yet. So you have information. See, it's all biblical history and secular history. Uh, and it shows, let me see, where do you see that on the side here? See, B, it shows it's all BC, circa 2500, etc. cetera. It says this biblical history on the bottom and the secular history on top. And that's how this page was organized. So it's a, a really fun Old Testament timeline. And they have a zillion of these. Look, here's in depth, the poetry of the Psalms. Now, the reason I'm showing all of this to you today is to say that um, when you're a heathen, this book is garbage. It means nothing. It's a Bible. Oh, that's a bunch of junk where they talk about God and God doesn't even exist. Nobody's ever seen him. Uh, there's no uh, proof that there's a God. You know, you can also say there's no proof that there's no God. So they're going to say, well, you can't prove God exists. I say, well, you can't prove that God doesn't exist. That's the reason that we're talking about all this right now. I want you to see that there's a lot of stuff out there that's available. And for an unbeliever, it's not available. They don't believe it. They say, oh, that's bunk, or we can't prove that. Look at this here. Zechariah, okay? What's Zechariah about? He was about encouragement and hope. And then it gives you the information, the author and date, uh, historical setting. And then uh, there's an outline. And over here, it shows about what was going on in history that in 605 BC, 
Nebuchadnezzar begins to reign in Babylon, 605 BC, same year still. Some Judeans are uh, taken captive. In 586 BC, Jerusalem falls to the Babylonians. So there's a historical timeline, and up here it shows the purpose and themes. See, Zechariah's prophecies had two purposes. First, challenging uh, the uh, the exiles to return to the, to turn to the Lord. See the returning exiles. Um, and second, Zechariah's words comforted and encouraged the people regarding the rebuilding of the temple of God's future work among His people, the temple and God's future work among His people. And so here it shows that it's about encouragement and hope. So these books are like. One of these books at the beginning, you know, but very short, right? Just a, an introduction or introductory information. And then you get to, you have an outline of Zechariah at the bottom here. Let me get that to show. And explaining all about what goes on in Zechariah. And then bingo, it begins. And look at all the notes. A call to repentance in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, or Darius, how people pronounce it. Uh, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah. Now notice, Berechiah is very close to the word Beracha, Baraka church, which is where Colonel R.B. Thiem taught. The son of Ido, the prophet, saying, verse 2, the Lord has been very angry with your fathers, verse 3. Therefore say to them, quote, Thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. By the way, that Lord of hosts business, that's where you have the Hebrew, it'll say um, Jehovah Sebaoth or Yahweh Sebaoth, the Lord, the, uh, the Lord of hosts. And so that is a technical Hebrew term and actual uh, let's call it uh, a, a name. It's both his name, but it's a term. And it means he's the Lord of the armies. And so at the very beginning, God is telling uh, Zechariah what to tell the Jews. And so that's what we're looking at, a call to repentance. Repentance. Um, next is his vision of the horses. And it goes on from there. Well, anyway, Study Bibles are amazing because they do, they're not just the old, look, it's all the words of the Bible, but no explanation. And you really got to know what you're doing to start to figure out who said what to whom and what does it mean. That's why we do exegesis. And who does exegesis? Well, an exegete does it, not everybody. Uh, you've got to be an exegete to do exegesis. But that takes us right into our segue going to the book, Principles and Practice of Greek Exegesis. And it says here, a classroom manual prepared by John D. Grasmick, who was a professor at Dallas Seminary. And where I wanted to, to kind of go today, I've been kind of bogged down because there's so much in this book. But what we do in and through exegesis is we figure out what's actually in the Bible. So to do that, there has to be a method to study the Bible, and therefore there is a method to do exegesis, and there's the importance of that method. And one of the books that I have of many, I mean, I'll grab two of them right here, are Methodical Bible Study by Robert A. Traina, and Basic Bible Interpretation, A Practical Guide to Discovering Biblical Truth by Dr. Zook, Roy B. Zook, who was a professor of mine uh, that I showed you uh, a note that he wrote to me back in the day when I was uh, graduating. Let me see, can I make that straight? There's Dr. Zook. He was a fun professor. It was a weird, wacky looking picture of him. But as wacky as that picture is, he was as wacky a guy. He was a wacky guy. Uh, it makes sense because anybody that does as crazy and serious a study as all that, uh, it's no wonder. 
um, that, that they would be wacky. Um, not that I resemble that remark. Uh, by the way, I'm going to take a sip of my usual Pellegrino and lime uh, juice. So cheers. Yum, that was good. What the whistle. Okay, so as we venture into these principles and practice of exegesis, um, you can see that the reason that exegesis needs to be done is we have to have a good method of interpretation. And, you know, the word exegete is, or exegesis is the word ek or ex, depending if it's from the Greek or Latin roots. Ek is Greek and ex is Latin. Um, and the other word, the part that's agesis, or actually ex agesis, um, it the agesis part actually comes from a hagesis or hagesis, and it's a word hegeomai. And it's the that word hegeomai is uh, you're pulling something, um, it's to grab something, and what you're doing, the X's or X is out from. So it's to get what's there, to get it out. And uh, let me see. Does I, I think I have, yeah, uh, one way to explain it is it says explanation, exposition, uh, like of a sentence or a word, etc. especially the interpretation of scripture or a scriptural passage. And then it says an exegete, is an expounder and interpreter. And uh, of Greek antiquity at Athens, one of those three members of the Eumolpidae, whose province it was to interpret the religious and ceremonial law, the signs in the heavens and oracles. Okay. And so it'd say Apollo himself was the supreme exegete, the ultimate source of legality. Uh, a second description of the exegete is one who explains or interprets difficult passages, one skilled in exegesis, an expounder. And so uh, that is just at the very beginning on page six uh, of this book. We covered that long ago. See, the meaning of the term exegesis. And there's all of that. There's, you know, more, as always. But we did that, oh, about three or four months ago. So lately, uh, we got to the point where I've been reading about study aids for exegesis. And... You know, there are factual aids like language tools and many reference works and and then interpretive aids such as commentaries and translations. And so we got into that a little bit and I started showing you some of the resource materials and we won't go back through all that, but uh, I will show you, for example, that one of the versions we looked at and this is for Greek exegesis, was the Greek New Testament. So it actually says New Testament Greek. So Novum Testamentum Graeke. And what you get out of that is a book that starts with all of the usual, like here's the German, uh, because it's a, a German bunch of people that put it together. And... So it starts, and what is this? The introduction business. And, and it's always explaining everything in German, you know, and so as usual, uh, you have to learn a lot of languages if you want to read all of these things. Now, what's good is the fact that after the German version, thank goodness for those of us who are not native German speakers and would prefer to have it an introduction, the edition and its text. This edition is the 26th edition, or no, is this one the 27th? Because I actually have the 28th and 29th as well. I think this one is, 
where does it say that it's which edition? Instead of tradition, edition, edition. That's from, in case you didn't know, uh, Fiddler on the Roof. Now we're getting into my artistic side. Oh, come on. I mean, I'm having a hard time finding the place where it tells you what edition it is. It talks about this edition, and then it doesn't tell you which one it is. All right, let me try this. Let me see if I can see it here in English. Of course, now we have pages after page. I'm pretty sure this is the 27th edition, and I could be mistaken that it's the 26th, but I know it's not the 28th. Because the 28th I have in my computers, and now there's the 29th. There we go. Novi Testamenti Textus. So the New Testament plural texts. But I still did not find the spot that says which edition this is. And I'm going to look one more little bit because I... That's frustrating to not know. Um, boy, a lot of German here. There it is. Novum Testamentum Graeke 26. So, uh, like I said, this is the 26th edition, and I have the 27th and 28th in computer. And this... Bible, where is it now? I'm looking for a Greek text. Um, it's the one that that Leonard has. Why is it not right in front of everything and handy? Where did that one go? You know, I'm always moving all my books around. So... I can't find, there it is. <laughs> Notice on the bottom here, it says, actually in the black section, UBS fifth edition, Nestle Allen 28th edition. So I have the latest, that's the latest edition. The little book was 26th and in the computer I have 27 and 28. And as well, 28 right there. All right, so um, all that said, as I can see, I have digressed. I got to put this paper back in here. Got to keep my papers straight. And in the right books. Um, so we looked at that Greek New Testament, and the other one that I have that's right next to it. The other one was Nestle Allen. This one is just called the United Bible Societies. Uh, and this one is US, uh, let's see, UBS3. And this one will be much easier to find. There it is. United Bible Societies there at the bottom and above it, third edition, correctly. And it's got some of the same folks that are a part of the other one, such as Bruce Metzger. And uh, the other ones are Nestle Olland and Bruce Metzger. So we look at that, and I was showing these different editions. And an interlinear English-Greek, we saw that just now that and how that works. And remember, we're in this area dealing with principles and practice of exegesis. Now, I've got a couple other books. I think I pulled this one up for a moment last time, the text of the New Testament, and it has a lot to show you, a lot of, uh, of course, uh, information, historical and grammatical stuff, but then it also shows texts and see how weird they look. Let's see, how do I get that one to show? Um, these are 
actual, let's see, the first one on the left, the Chester Beatty Biblical Papyrus 2, P46, which is uh, Romans chapter 15, verses 29 to 33, and 16, verses 25 to 27. Um, and the actual size is nine inches by six inches. That's this one right here. And again, you say, wow, it's a bunch of scribble. No, it's not. It's Greek. And we can read that. And, you know, when you're good at textual criticism, you can figure out what each line says, because you may want to notice there's generally 32 letters in each one. Those bottom ones, parts ripped out. They would put 32 letters together. So if you count them, there's going to be 32 letters on each line. And that means if they're not done with the word, they continue it on the next line. And that was part of the scribal techniques. And there are notes sometimes that you see on the side. Now, the other one is called the Bodmer Papyrus uh, 14, which is P75. The P always stands for Paul. And it's about uh, 175 to 225 AD. And it's in a library in uh, Geneva. And it contains Luke 16, 9 to 21. And the name of the rich man is given in line eight from the bottom. See page 42. Actual size, 10 and 3 eighths inches by 5 and an eighth. So this is the section in Luke where you hear about the rich man. Uh, that would be this one here. And so, uh, see there on the bottom, it gives you these details. And so, uh, all of this to say that these kinds of books are tools for us to learn. Notice this is from Oxford in England, which is, you know, one of the the more august institutions in the world. These are heavy duty books from heavy duty uh, authors who are professors at heavy duty institutions. Okay, and so for example, uh, the one we were just looking at, Bruce Metzger, the text of the New Testament, it's transmission, corruption, and restoration. Now here it just says the text of the New Testament, right? But then, in second edition, when you open it and you get to see the actual name of the book, here's where it says the text of the New Testament, its transmission, corruption, and restoration. And by the way, he was a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary in the United States, even though this is published by Oxford University Press, New York, and Oxford. So point being, these wonderful and special books are kind of interesting. Like this one's in the day in like 1990 would be 1695 and used to take the one off the front. And it's Pilgrim Discount Used Books in Portland, Oregon a place that we probably don't want to go to now. Um, I don't even know if the bookstore is still there, but if it is, uh, they may not have these kinds of books. <laughs> um, so there are all these important things. Like this one is a, was a reference book, and the exegete should investigate the resource books like that one, and from them form the initial core of his growing library of resource tools. Now, the next area, and that first one was texts of the New Testament type information, and we're not going to go too much further here. The next one is concordances to the New Testament. A New Testament Greek concordance is an alphabetical index of each occurrence of the principal words used in the New Testament along with a portion of their immediate context. And... Um, Trying to see how far I'm going to go. Uh, let's keep going. Um, the major advantages of a good concordance include, one, locating a reference by means of a keyword. Two, defining 
and enriching word meanings through a study of their usage and context. So see, you're starting to get to know words and multiple uses of the word. So um, we call that lexical domains. So a word can have various different meanings and be used different ways, right? So when it says defining and enriching word meanings through a study of their usage and context. Three, investigating grammatical relationships. So example given, the use of akuo with the genitive in contrast to its use with the accusative. Now, the word akuo is the word to hear. We get an English word right away. You're learning Greek, but you don't know it. Guess what? You know that word. Only you know it is this, not akuo, but acoustics, right? Uh, good acoustics or what, you know, how is that room in terms of its acoustic qualities? Does it have, is it dry or do you hear a reverberation? When I clap, you hear something like if you walk into my studio and do that because of all the deadening that I've got to tune the room, you hear the clap and then nothing. It just sucks it in. Here, there's a room big enough with nine foot ceilings. You can see this. See how the ceilings go way up? And so in a big room like this, a clap will have a, a resonance to it. And so the word akuo, and let me show it to you in Greek, and you'll kind of see it even in Greek writing. Uh, let me point it out. There it is. A-K-O-U long O. Oh, my God. So akuo. And we get A-C-O-U-S-T-I-C, -C, acoustic, acoustics. And so what it says is we investigate what's the difference of akuo with a genitive or possessive case, for example, uh, in contrast to its use as an object. And, okay, fourth part of this major advantages of a good concordance Distinguishing between synonyms by comparing their use in different contexts, especially where both words appear. So sometimes you have two synonyms and somebody is doing a play on words and that kind of thing. And so you start to figure out the contexts and it's especially easier to do it when both words appear in there and you're able to figure it out. So it says suggested Greek concordances. There's Molten Gedon, a concordance to the Greek New Testament. This is the standard Greek accordance for the New Testament, common abbreviation MG, Molten Gedon. Now, I showed you that one last time. We won't get into it now, but it's Molten Gedon and Molten. It's two brothers. And here it is a concordance of the Greek, uh, concordance to the Greek. Uh, Testament, fifth edition, and by T and T Clark, and so again, uh, this one mentions Molten Gedon, common abbreviation MG, the standard concordance, and let me tell you, it's special. You can see it's even got its own case where you can pull the book out, and then the book has all this fancy clear plastic business around it to protect it. And in the day in 1993, it was about $60. And just to show you, we went into this before, but this is what it looks like. So if you are not an exegete, this book will do you very little good because as you can see, <coughs> excuse me, everything about it is in Greek. and nothing but stuff that you've got to be able to read and understand. And again, um, most of it, see, there's some Corinthians and then over here, what do we got? Um, uh, see, so Mark, Luke, and John, and it's all about particular words. 
So like in this case, the word to be a me or I me, depending on how people pronounce it. So these are resources of which any exegete is going to have at least a couple of them. And I do, I have various ones. And let me tell you, some of them are pretty weird and uh, astonishingly deep. Uh, another one mentioned, let's see, I don't have this Wigram English, Englishman's Greek concordance of the New Testament. The Greek words are listed as in Molten Gedon, but the quotations are given in English according to the authorized version. Well, it's two reasons I don't have it. One, I don't need it given in English. And two, the authorized version is basically a, an inferior uh, translation. And so I don't need a concordance of that, although I, in a different way, I do have it because I have it in something called, and it's the couple down here, says suggested English concordances are young analytical concordance to the Bible. And I forget if I have that one or not, but I don't have it here handy. I think I do have it, analytical concordance to the Bible. Um, but this one is the one that I would use. Uh, the one that I had first called the exhaustive concordance of the Bible. And it says this work is more complete, meaning than the young one, uh, but not efficient for studying the usage of a Greek word. It contains every word used in the authorized version, again, from the King James. Now, I got that first, and it was way before I went to seminary. And this is what that one looks like. And as you can see, it's a, it's a pretty good sized book about the size of my chest here. Um, and the reason they like it is because it's exhaustive, but it is a uh, complete concordance of the English Bible, but it's from the King James Version. But see on the back, it tells you it's got all these nice things that we'll look at another time because we're going to be closing here shortly. And, and this one is great when you're not an exegete because if you only know English, you can look at these, you know, and you can see it's pretty heavy duty if that's what every page looks like, you know. <laughs> There's a lot of small writing and, I mean, it, it's a, a very complete, that's why it's well known. And I won't get into it in detail here and now, but I do want you to see it. And there are wonderful things about this book. It's got a lot of really cool stuff. Um, here it's got a keyword comparison uh, handout, you know, listing many ways to understand stuff in this book, which is really a nice book. And oh, oops, what I remember about it was it wasn't very expensive and I don't know why. See, sample from uh, Strong's exclusive keyword comparison. So it'll show you a verse and then it'll show you these words used in the different versions. And so, like I said, it is a scholarly work. It is an excellent resource. It's listed in our exegetical, um, you know, pr principles and practice book because it is a very neat, you know, very cool book. By the way, I still, I can't remember why I got it so cheap. Look. It said $9.95. <laughs> and so I know I paid that amount. I paid $9.95 for it. I don't know where I got it. Don't remember. Let's see. Do I put the – no, I never wrote in my name and the date. So uh, it had to have been either in the 70s or at the latest. At the latest, it was in the early 80s. I must have had this book back then. So at least 40 years ago. And like I say, for 10 bucks, 
you know, here's one of them 60 and one of them's 10 and they're huge. They weigh a ton. You can press your pants with them. You know, it's really crazy, this stuff. But um, all that to say that a concordance is a very useful tool, especially when you're early on in your word studies and you want to try to understand something about the origin of the word and its meanings and different uses. So um, let's see, where are we? The exhaustive concordance of the Bible. This work is more complete than the young analytical concordance to the Bible, which has that one had, and this is more complete than that, had about 311,000 references from the authorized version. So this one's even more complete and contains every word used in the authorized version. So where we're going to start next time is something called lexicons and lexical aids uh, for the New Testament. And I'll just say this, and this is the introduction, and then we'll read it again. It's two sentences or three. Um, and we'll do it again next week. A lexicon is a guide to the meaning of a word. It aids the student by gathering together all the evident uses of a word and classifying them. Then a judgment is made concerning the meaning of the word in a given context. So uh, I'd love to continue this, but I'll stop myself and make it uh, something for next time. And it will be something for next time. So see if I can find all these deals where I'm putting my notes. So um, we will continue with all of this and hopefully it'll help you have more and more an understanding. Um, and like we saw tonight in the Nelson study Bible, look, I just turned to this page. The doctrine of salvation, the meaning of salvation in the Bible. And look, Old Testament, what does it mean? And New Testament. And then about Jesus the Savior. And then it goes on to salvation in the Bible. Two more pages to show category, kind, type, when, what, how, and passages. Salvation from sickness, from death, from danger, from God's wrath, from sin, from false doctrine. You see how many ways... That can already be said. And then um, the, the first page continues on the fourth page as far as uh, explaining stuff about salvation, calling, predestination, law, regeneration, justification, all these aspects of salvation. So a good study Bible has all these kinds of extra helps. You know, there are notes, there are uh, explanations and subject matter and stuff like that. So you can see there's a lot to it. Let me see if I read this thing. It says, uh, introducing Nelson's complete study system to bring you the finest study Bible ever. Remember, I was showing you this. And it shows all these different, you know, things that are in this particular Bible that made it a really wonderful resource and a wonderful means of reading the scripture and interpreting things like we we're saying our hermeneutic, our method of interpretation in a way that's accurate. That's what's really hard. That's why exegesis is a big deal. People come up with all kinds of stuff, and as a result, they argue and disagree, and they start new religions. We don't need any new religions. We only need, let's call it, one means of having a relationship with the God of the universe. But to know if you're on that right track and have that means and are doing what God wants you to do, doing it and doing it his way. That's part of what all this exegesis business is about. So on that note, 
we pray that we're on the right track. But in order to pray, you have to, first thing is be in fellowship with the God of the universe. And most people don't know that. And so when they pray, God doesn't even hear their prayers. So what's the difference? How do you know when God's hearing your prayer? And we did that book. There's a book called Prayer. And we read it and we learned all about these things. That first you have to be in fellowship. So rebound, First John 1, 9, if necessary. Second, Thanksgiving. Third, intercession. And there's all these great things down here, these categories to pray. And the last one is petition. And I tell everybody, if you want us to pray, you can either write it in the uh in the comments there, or you can email me or write to me. And if you have my phone number, you can call me and say, hey, got an issue. Could you be praying about this? Or could you also mention on the broadcast, anybody that hears it, to pray for blah, 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 whatever it would be. So that's a part of all of this. And like I said, so the first part is to make sure you're in fellowship. So 1 John 1, 9, if necessary. Second part, Thanksgiving, where the first thing you do in prayer is thank God for the relationship you have with him and for your salvation and for all the good things going on and that he will help even with the bad things that are going on and that you trust him. And then third, you go right into praying for what? For intercession for others. And that is so important because you take your eyes off yourself and you look at other people and you realize your ministry to them is to be there for them in any way you can. And one of the ways immediately always is to be able to be in intercessory prayer, which means you're there interceding on their behalf. You're going to God the way the Lord is going to God, the father. And, and he is always our advocate. He is defending us. He is like an attorney praying for us and giving us uh, support, an advocate. And, um, and then uh, as we pray for others and others' needs and other things and like for our government, you know, what is that? That's a thing. It's not a person. It's a bunch of people and it's a bunch of things. And we pray for protection that our government will have God's wall of fire around it and will be, uh, whatever the term might be, pulling out the dross <laughs> by the, uh, what was that expression? By the hair on your chinny chin chin. Um, and that we would be protected. And then fourth and final, so there's, there's rebound, there's uh, thanksgiving, there's intercessory prayer, and finally, petition, where we bring our petitions personally between ourselves and the Lord and say, Lord, what about this? What should I do? And what about that? And, you know, it, show me the way, that kind of thing. Give me a sign. Aha. So um, all that being said, if uh, there are no other comments from the chat room, I'm going to go ahead and close us in prayer and continue the night uh, with all the other stuff I have to do, as well as getting ready, uh, including tomorrow and Wednesday for Wednesday night's uh, uh, Philemon continuation. And then on Thursday, uh, as I mentioned, this particular Thursday, we will continue with where I mentioned earlier tonight, started to mention our, let's call it uh, exposition of what is going on in our country. And in fact, I was with the Yavapai Patriots. They have now changed the name to Yavapai Rising. And we'll have a meeting on August 21st again. And as it says here, if you seek an honest, uncensored evaluation of the state of our nation, come here, Dave, this guy, uh, Dave Hodges of the Common Sense Show. Dave's knowledgeable and predictive analysis of our country's current situation 
gain a startling insight into the future of what could happen to Arizona and America. So that's one of the future uh, meetings that I'm going to. But as I said, we will on Thursday night see what this wonderful sheriff, Mark uh, J. Daniels, who's a terrific guy, and a little bit about a preparedness team that is working on all the details of things that we need to keep in mind. And there's the sheriff right there. And if you notice on his collars there, he's got four stars. When you find out more about him, uh, you'll see that he's not your average sheriff, Matt Dillon, who's not average at all. <laughs> he, but if Matt Dillon was a good sheriff in the story of uh, Gunsmoke, wait till uh, you see about Cochise County's uh, whatever you call him, the full-blown four-star sheriff in charge of all the other sheriffs, which I think there's a hundred of them in his uh, county. So, um, and he is the 26th Cochise County Sheriff since 1881. And very interesting. He's had a 37-year career in law enforcement has a master's degree in criminal justice management from Aspen University and is a certified public manager from Arizona State University and has over 3,000 hours of law enforcement training in his portfolio. Imagine if he's got three hours, 3,000 hours of training, how many hours he's been uh, on the job, 37 years. And so there's a lot more, and I'm going to try to let you know a little bit more about him and especially where he's coming from and then all of the things that you would want to know that are going on in Arizona that are affecting you wherever you are and that are going to be affecting all of us. There are a whole bunch of things going on here. And it's not, these letters are not classified. They're all public. But the idea is that nobody knows about them. And so sadly, nobody knows that this stuff is going on. And why? It's not in the news. So, you know, here's a letter from the governor, state of Arizona, to the Secretary of Homeland Security, February 17th. And our governor is writing to the Homeland Security, um, you know, secretary. And do you know what that letter says? And do you know what our government did with that letter? Meaning they know what's going on? Look at this one, State of Arizona, Department of Emergency and Military Affairs. And this is written from, uh, from both the governor and the adjutant general to the senior official performing the duties of FEMA administrator. So he was the acting uh, administrator and you know, look at the date on this one, February 19th. All right, so all of this stuff is going on, and you're not seeing these letters. And think about it. This is the state of Arizona only. And I've got stuff here that, you know, from mayors of different cities on the subject release of undocumented immigrants, and it's addressed to the two state senators for Arizona, the new, look, March 18th, Senators Kristen, uh, or Kirsten Cinema and Mark Kelly. All right, so um, I've got a lot of information here. And what I want to do is tie it together so that you understand, you know, some stuff that's going on that you may not have seen in the news. 
and it adds up. And let me tell you, it's real serious because what I know already is that next month, we're going to start having a million immigrants a month coming in. <laughs> you know, um, it's taken a while, what, six or seven months to get over a million people into Arizona. And in one month, it's going to jump probably to two million. And at that point, you'll be hearing about it in the news, of course. But where did you hear that in the news so far lately? Well, I hear it from top law enforcement and government, you know, uh, servants. So check that out, right? All right. On that note, with nothing else uh, going on, we have a busy week tonight, Wednesday night and Thursday night. Hope to see you Wednesday and Thursday. And now let's close in prayer. So, Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for our time together and the fact that we can spend time with you and have a relationship with you. You are the awesome God. There are no others. Everything else is fake. It's either angelic conflict nonsense and demons and whatnot. Uh, there are no other gods. So everything else is just a veil and a bunch of flack coming at us all over the world from everywhere. We thank you that you have a shield, a wall of fire around us that keeps us safe and keeps us in the know. And by being in fellowship, we can have this relationship with you and learn doctrine and store it and apply it when necessary. It's going to be necessary to apply a lot of things in the very near upcoming, you know, days coming future. So please continue to grow us in a way that will glorify you and that will make it so that we can make great decisions and uh, help ourselves and our neighbors and our nation and from that vantage point, even the world. And we thank you for all these things, especially all the goodies that we saw tonight. Please sanctify these truths to the nourishment of our souls. We ask this with Yeshua HaMashiach in Christ's name. Amen. So carry on and hopefully see you uh, again in the chat, so to speak, uh, on Wednesday and uh, lots more good stuff coming right away. Coming up. So on that note, have a good night and we will continue Wednesday night in Philemon. See you then. All right, and Leonard says, thank you, and thanks for being there, Leonard, and uh, be well, do well, and uh, also a good night to you. This is good stuff. So uh, have a good one till then. See you then, and talk to you maybe along the way in between or next, probably actually you will have to be on the weekend. One of us get a hold of each other. Everybody else, you can get a hold of me too. Remember, right there and right there. See you soon. All right. Good night, everybody.